and welcome to the Washington Farm Bureau Update, a podcast designed to provide the latest agriculture, legislative, and Farm Bureau information. Greetings, all Ben Tyndall here, and I'm really looking forward to sharing with you today's podcast as Bailey Moon and I talk with Farm Bureau member Venice Cunningham. Venice is the co-founder with her sister Belinda Kelly of Simple Goodness Sisters, and she farms the Simple Goodness Cocktail Farm in Buckley. I guess my biggest hope is that other farms think about how do we make a farm profitable when you're paying so much in land prices. And for us, it's been this kind of really crazy niche um, and then really maximizing every single cent that we can out of the crops that we're growing. Okay, well, let's get started, shall we? Bailey, it's always better when you're a part of the conversation. So thanks for joining today. Thanks for having me. Venice, thank you so much for taking the time to join us and chat about the uh, the farm and what's going on with Simple Goodness Sisters. I really appreciate this. Yeah, I'm excited to join you guys. Good, good. Well, Bailey, let me actually start with you. Now, Venice has been a member of Farm Bureau for numerous years now, but how did you get connected and kind of tell us about uh, how did you learn about the work that she and her sister Belinda are doing? Yeah, well, it was actually kind of by chance. And I'm so excited that it was by chance that we kind of stumbled upon the Simple Goodness Sisters. I actually connected a while back through Instagram, just following the page and just seeing what they were up to. But then was sent a press release about this um, awesome grant that they received and just an opportunity to learn more about what they were doing. And I was intrigued because it's such a niche um, industry that Simple Goodness, and I'll let Venice kind of share a little bit more about what they do, but it's a very cool um, component of agriculture that we don't always talk about at Farm Bureau. So I was excited to, you know, connect with Venice and Belinda and just hear their story. And this is actually my second time chatting with them, but um, I'm excited for them to be able to tell their story on our podcast today for all of our members to hear. Well, now, Venice, I'll turn it over to you. So you are the co-founder of Simple Goodness Sisters, which is an amazing operation. I have been really excited to talk to you about your work and uh, what you're doing. Tell me a little bit about your history. It's actually kind of fascinating. How did you get involved in farming? Great question. <laughs> and it's kind of a long answer. But we are first generation, uh, first generation farm. So neither my husband, my sister, or I grew up on a farm, but we had grandparents who both had kind of hobby farms, small farms that our parents had grown up on. And so we had heard a lot of stories about, you know, what it was like to grow up on the farm. And we live in Western Washington. Farms are much, much smaller here than they are in other places. So we bought our farm about eight years ago in Buckley. And it was Right about at that time when like the real estate market was really changing and we knew that if we didn't buy something quickly, we would really quickly be priced out of any big acreage. And by big, we're on 10 acres, so it's not that big. (laughs) And so we kind of risked it all and sold our house that we were in and moved to the farm with absolutely zero experience. (laughs) Uh, And so the first thing that we did was decide, you know, what we wanted to do. We, our farm is an old dairy farm. So our house is about a hundred years old and we have some big barns, which was helpful in that we weren't building from absolute scratch. So we started out and we say that we start, we got into farming by Google because we, (laughs) I literally just Googled uh, most profitable crop to grow on small acreage because I had never really even had a garden. My sister was more of a gardener. It ended up being garlic. So we, Mm. our very first year here, we just put a bunch of garlic in the ground. Um, And through that venture, we met a lot of other local farmers because we literally didn't know what we were doing. And so we reached out to other farmers who um, had been growing garlic. We connected with other seed garlic growers. And it was through those connections that I realized that I really enjoyed being in the farm community and meeting other farmers. And that was like, 
the part of my job that I really enjoyed. We started out with this garlic and goats festival. It was really fun. Um, a lot of people got to know our farm because we invited people out to the farm yeah. to pick up garlic and kind of walk around and see it. And that was really the beginning of the farming. And if you had told me this is where I'd be today, it would I would say no way. So at that time, I didn't have any children. And so we were putting a lot of our effort into the farm and renovating it for what would work for us. And then I had, I got pregnant and I had my first baby and she was a fall baby. And so garlic is a fall crop. You plant it in the fall, usually right around October. And she's a late September birthday. birthday. So I basically had this brand new baby. My world had been changed, turned upside down. And I did not even care about planting garlic that fall. (laughs) Um, Priorities so do change, up, don't like, they? Yes. And so I ended up losing all of that seed. And garlic seed is very expensive um, because you typically only invest in it once and then you regenerate your seed. And so I was like, okay, here we are. My seed is all bad. Um, I either have to decide that we're going to reinvest in a bunch more seed or I have to pivot. And so that's where the biggest pivot came in because. I decided that I was ready to bite off a little bit more. And my sister at the time, she had also, we had our babies two weeks apart. And she had decided that it was going to be really hard. We both also worked corporate jobs and we commuted to Seattle, which is a two hour commute for us each way. And so she decided that the commute and this new mom life was not going to work for her either. And so she was trying to think about what she was going to pivot into and she saw this gap in the market and it was um, really well thought out curated bar um, catering. So there's this really great, you know, farm to table movement that has happened in the Seattle market and people wanting to get close to their food and know their farmer when it comes to food. But what we realized is like a lot of people still have no idea where their drinks are coming from Um, a little bit in like the spirits and beer world, but not really in like in any of their sweeteners, not definitely not in like soda. (laughs) Um, And so she was like, if I'm going to quit my job and I'm going to like, again, kind of risk it all in this career that I had built, I want to do this cocktail catering in a way that is uniquely me. And because she was very much a gardener before I was, and because I had the farm, she's like, I want to do this, what we call now garden to glass concept so where i am really close and i'm making as much of the mixers and i'm sourcing from the local farms even my sister if i'm able and so she launched what is called the happy camper cocktail company and it's catering company in doing so she realized the gap in the farming world where there was a lot of farmers who were growing herbs to sell um at markets but it's kind of like an afterthought so she basically came to me and was like hey, you're not growing garlic anymore, or at least not this year, you're not growing garlic. Would you mind putting, you know, some edible flowers and herbs in the garden um, for me? And so I was like, yeah, sure, I can try that. Like, it's a good segue into something new, which I was wanting. And so that's what I did. And it turns out that I'm fairly good at growing herbs and edible flowers. (laughs) And Belinda's really good at making drinks. And so what happened was I went to her first event, big event, like public event, not a little private, like backyard event. And everyone, there was lines all the way out the door and everyone loved her drink. And at that particular event, we were selling um, a rhubarb vanilla bean syrup, a rhubarb vanilla bean drink. So it had rhubarb vanilla bean syrup and then it had champagne and it had gin and everyone loved it and they wanted the recipe. And so I came along and I was hauling ice for her and I kept overhearing people talk about how great the drink was and kind of asking for the recipe and asking what's in it. And, you know, it's just champagne and gin at the end of the day, but what made it unique and different and fun for everyone was rhubarb vanilla bean syrup. But to make rhubarb vanilla bean syrup, you have to find rhubarb. Um, which a lot of people don't even know necessarily where to get rhubarb. And then it's, we use a whole vanilla bean, we scrape it, and then you have to like boil it, and then you make the syrup. So what I realized is like most people, when they want to have a cocktail, do not want to bust out the pots and pans and make themselves a syrup. <laughs> <laughs> right. So then I was like, hey, Belinda, you know what would be cool is if much like a barbecue 
Joy bottles their famous barbecue sauce and sells it? What if you bottled your simple syrup and then you sold it and you source as much of this stuff and we design flavors around what we can grow on the farm? And so it took a little bit of convincing. I'm not going to lie. Belinda will acknowledge. Like, she's like, I just started this brand new company and now you want me to start another one? <laughs> um, and we had no idea, again, like just, you know, just like so many farmers out there, we had no idea how to turn a raw crop into a shelf-stable bottled pro- product. And there is a lot of hoops to jump through, but I was determined. So I convinced her that it would be fine. We'd be able to figure out it's no big deal. <laughs> Well, and, and then kind of the rest is history. So, uh, oh, that's so much fun, though. And it's got to, I, I love the perspective that you provide to new farmers. It is a, a risk. It is an adventure. Um, you got to take that leap of faith, but you're able to look back and see that progress and be that voice for those new farmers who, yeah, maybe they don't have an experience in the their background, but they have Google and they've got 10 acres or whatever, and they can make something. Definitely. There's so many different resources out there from, you know, mentorship to Google to, you know, also there's just so much value in like learning as you go. And it's been hard, but it's been very, very rewarding. And it's been really fun. Yes. Yes. But you're showing that it is doable if you have that determination and the, the drive and that passion for it, which it really comes through that you do. I also love to hear that you feel like there were so many resources for you to become a farmer through Google, because I know at the Farm Bureau, we get a lot of questions with first generation farmers just wanting to know where do they even begin? Um, and that's something that as a team that we we would like to help more with. I know just ha- pointing people in the right direction for where those resources are, because I know it probably takes a lot of digging, but they are out there. Yeah, I would say definitely they're out there. It does take digging. And I will say that Um, I did a lot of work with Pierce County Fresh when I was transitioning. So it was, it was honestly a really great program. It was great for me because it connected me to a lot of other farmers and to a lot of the other resources. It was also helpful because I worked for them for a little bit on a contract basis. So it did help me transition from, you know, that full time salary job to a full time off farm job where I rely on myself. So that was great. And I think a lot of people don't realize that about farmers is like, there's usually somebody working off farm jobs in some capacity. And a lot of farmers are working more than just their farm job. But yeah, I will say that like the mentorship and reaching out, like I said, with the garlic, especially we had one guy and he like knew every variety of garlic and he had been growing, not just garlic, but garlic in our area for so long that he just came over. It took him like an hour He gave us like garlic 101 class and it would have taken me hours and hours and hours of researching. But like that has been huge and like being willing to put yourself out. And I think the other big thing is taking the time and making the commitment to get off of the farm is the hardest because you're there. You're like, that's why you farm. It's because you like to be on your farm. But at the end of the day, like every time I have decided to get off the farm and go to some networking thing or go to some events, or go some, to some class or workshop, it's been a valuable experience for me. Let, let me ask you this. I've absolutely loved looking and kind of getting to know the organization, kind of your operation out there. I've really enjoyed just seeing the whimsy and quirkiness that really your operation has in various areas. So talk to me about Simple Goodness Sisters. There are numerous things that you and Belinda are undertaking under this. So tell me a little bit about what y'all are doing with Simple Goodness Sisters. Yeah, so right now we have the farm um, and we are farming. But then this last year was a really challenging but also exciting year because we decided. So about three years ago, I decided that we were we would probably be needing a kitchen. And Belinda needed a kitchen for her catering company. And so I very randomly started looking for a place where we could produce something from the farm. So we started looking for real estate. And just up the road is a very small town. It's Wilkinson, Washington. It's on the way to Mount Rainier. So we so there's quite a bit of like tourist traffic that goes through there. But there's also just like a really great small community. There's about 500 people in the town. We love small towns. And so there was this building for sale. It had been a cafe and it had a tiny little kitchen in the back. It needed a ton of work. 
but it had the, you know, basic bones that we needed. And so I somehow, again, convinced my sister and then also my dad and then also our grandma um, that we should have this building. <laughs> <laughs> and so we ended up buying the building with a lot of help. So we decided, you know, it would be cool is if uh, one day we could build this cafe where people could come and taste our syrup. Because the hardest thing about syrups is a lot of people don't use them or don't know how to use them. And, um, and like, you can be extremely creative with them, but we have learned much, like a lot of people who grow food that you kind of have to tell people how to eat their food. Right. And so the soda shop was born or the idea of the soda shop was born. And it's really our version of a tasting room, much like a winery or a brewery would have. And it's a place where people can come. They can see all the different ways we use our syrup. So we do salads and we use our lemon herb syrup in the salad dressing. We, in the winter, we have waffle sticks and we use our syrups on the waffle sticks. We obviously make cocktails with all of our syrups. We also do non-alcohol, non-alcoholic sodas. We also have an ice cream shop. So we put, we, you can put any of the syrups on ice cream. So it's really designed to show everything that you can do with the syrups. We had plans to open that last June, and of course, everything changed with our plans, and so we finally did open in October, and we were open through Christmas, and then it will probably always be a seasonal-based business because in the winter, like most farmers, we take January off so that we can rest because that's the only time we're not actively trying to figure out what we're growing. And then in February, March, and April, we are starting seeds and doing a lot of farm planning and production planning for the next year. And then we open up again in May and we stay open May through December. Well, I, I was kind of curious. So you, you have what you know as kind of the first cocktail farm. Then you mentioned this farm to your glass model. Has this kind of been a catalyst to others seeing value to this model and others? Have you seen others get excited about this and want to jump on board with, you know, this is a fantastic idea of we do, we educate people on what they're eating, but what about what they're drinking? Have you seen any sort of movement in that, that front from uh, others who are interested in this too? Yeah. I mean, definitely from our customers. So our customers are customers who you know, are cheering along the farmers in across the nation. And we are the only cocktail farm that I know of. And when we say that we're a cocktail farm, it's, you know, just like anything else, it's not like we're growing anything crazy. It's just that um, we are growing all herbs and edible flowers and everything that we're growing is designed to eventually go into a cocktail. So the idea is that as a farmer, it's really hard to see any of the crops that you put a lot of time and energy into going to waste. So we're growing as much as we can. And then we're trying to get creative about how we shift and then turn that into something, whether it's for the soda shop or the cocktail farm. So we just launched Cocktail Farm Club. And this is our version of a farm CSA, if you will. And it's that every other month we ship out a box and the box has one of our, what we call our flagship flavors. So they're the flavors that are kind of our tested, tried and true. And then you get a small bottle of a specialty flavor. And these are oftentimes like one time bottling, small run when like when the farm has a bumper crop, for example, last year the farm had a bumper crop of basil. Like I had so much basil, it got really hot at the end of the year and it kind of just exploded. And so I was like, we should do a syrup with basil in it. So we did a lime basil syrup and that was the first syrup that went out in our cocktail farm club. The idea is to really take the opportunities that present that mother nature presents itself and turn them into a syrup that makes a delicious cocktail. So that's something that we just launched and we're very excited about and really gets that gives us the opportunity to tell the story of not only our farms, but other farms in the area. Um, And so that's been fun. We also do with that cocktail farm club, we do a happy hour and it's a live zoom happy hour with any of our cocktail farm club members that want to hop on and we mix up a drink together and we've just started inviting other brands to kind of tell their story. So last month we partnered with Woodenville Whiskey and Woodenville Whiskey is a cool whiskey company in Washington because they have a single farmer that they work with and he's over in Quincy and he's actually also 
a friend of ours. So it was a really cool story to be able to tell again about another local company that is, you know, kind of following this garden to glass or this farm to bar model. So yes, there, it's definitely picking up. You're definitely starting to see it. Um, but I, I think that we are kind of on the forefront of that. I love it. But I love the collaboration that you're looking to do this with people. You're looking to network. You're stronger with other people doing this together. What an incredible model. I love it. Well, I, I, I am kind of curious, and this may be a question that you're like, yeah, you, you need to take a class to know. But uh, just because out of my ignorance, how, did, how do you make your syrups? You take the grown products. Now what? Yeah, so we take the products. We put it in hot water like it's a big... Right now, we use a co-packer. Um, we are in the process of bringing our production in-house. But it's very similar to kind of making beer. Again, you can do it a lot of different ways. But basically, you put it all in a bunch of hot water. I think the key with ours and what makes ours different is that we pick our flavors. So they're designed to be in cocktails. So you can do a bunch of different flavors. But we like to layer flavors on top of each other. And so every flavor that we pick is designed to be able to be mixed with the minimal added ingredients. And so we do that in the syrup. So you can add spirit and bubbles if you want. And then you basically have a balanced cocktail and it's very, very simple. We also don't add any preservatives or stabilizer. So all of our preservatives are natural in the fact that like we don't even use citric acid. And so everything is preserved with either a citrus, so like lemon or lime juice, or the actual pH of the ingredients. We don't come from a food science background, so we're not very scientific about it. We come from a family that did a lot of canning, and so we know the very basics of canning, or we knew. We know a lot more because you have to take a lot of classes <laughs> in order to get your certification to be able to do a shelf-stable product. But at the beginning, it's like very basic canning principles that are still applied to make food shelf-stable today. Oh, that's so much fun. I love this. Yeah. <laughs> I am so intrigued by the flavor profiles that you've developed. And I have to ask, has there ever been something that you've tried to put together and it's just failed miserably and not blended the way that you thought? Yeah. I mean, that definitely happens a lot. For the most part, what we're using is like really fresh fruits and vegetables. So it is a little bit harder to get misses. But for example, the berry sage is a really good example. The hardest part is turning the herb to the the part of the syrup that is the pH balancer. So that was challenging. So we did like when we made the berry sage, it was like we tested it with berry sage, berry, rosemary, berry thyme, like all the different herbs. And then like we and then we also we test them, but then we also let our family test them because we like the fact that our starts can be enjoyed by the whole family. And so between all of that, we usually land on the one that like the most people like, which is fun. With Cocktail Farm Club, the fun thing is that we get to try things that are a little bit like push the envelope a little bit. And so we've really enjoyed coming up with different recipes for that because we do a small run and then we might not do that syrup flavor ever again, but it's fun to try something that is different. I love it. Me too. It sounds like the whole the whole family's involved, and that's great. Oh, yes. We're definitely, between my sister and I, we have four kids, and they're all six and under. So um, we still have little kids that are running around, and that's been a challenge in and of itself. <laughs> but it's fun, and we, you know, when we open the soda shop, we knew that it was cocktails, and but we really wanted to be very deliberate about it being family friendly because our kids are in there all the time, and we wanted it to be a place that our kids can enjoy too. And so we kind of call it like the family friendliest bar you've ever been to because it feels very much like an ice cream or like a coffee shop, although we don't have coffee, but that you can get a drink at. And so it's fun. We have a lot of families that come in and try our hearts in a bunch of different ways. Oh, well, that, that is one of the things uh, that's really easy. So w when you purchase your products or when you, you go to the soda shop, one of the things that's really easy to notice is that your products are beautifully packaged, very eye-catching. Your, your shop is very attractive. 
I love I, actually I loved reading the review that uh, what Matt Wakefield with the Tacoma Travel Tacoma said. He said it looks like it was designed for an Instagram Hall of Fame photo shoot. I thought that was great. So, <laughs> what was the process around designing your label or the general aesthetic of the soda shop? Uh, I have to give a lot of that credit to my sister and then my cousin. I tend to think as a farmer in much more practical or like functional terms. And my sister is very aesthetic driven. And so she had a vision of what she wanted for the packaging, um, specifically the label and the logo. And then we have a cousin who is a graphic designer and who is amazing. And, um, and so she did help us design the packaging. Packaging is very, very important to us. You know, when you're thinking about going into wholesale, which we are doing um, a lot of our wholesale partners are gift shops so their stores are very well curated and have a particular like look and feel and so they love our label a lot of people have bought our product just because of the way it looks not knowing at all what it tastes like <laughs> <laughs> that says a lot that's uh, that's fantastic yeah and we are on instagram we like i said we started our instagram way way back before we ever had a product to sell and actually it was like our instagram and then we also blogged i would just say especially to new farmers like just start telling your story i say this all the time to people tell your story before you have anything to sell and eventually you will have something to sell and then you'll have the customers right there and that is what happened with us like we have been instagramming for a very very long time and it was like actually the Instagram that really drove us to like launch something that we could monetize. So, cause we were spending a bunch of time telling our story and writing our blog and we weren't making any money doing it. And so then we were like, Oh, well, if we had a product, I bet the people that have <laughs> followed us for this long would maybe buy it. And then they would tell their friends and then they would tell their friends. And that is truly how we have built our business. Yeah. Well, well, that plays right into one of the things I wanted to ask you about, and you kind of touched on it, but what would you say to someone looking to to take this jump and start a new endeavor in agriculture? I mean, it's terrifying and exciting at the same time and stressful as well as life-giving and, 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 and all that mixed up in one. So what would you tell someone who has an idea that they're kind of toying with? Um, I would say... Just go ahead and start. I think a lot of times, and we do this even ourselves, but is that we like worry about all of the obstacles ahead of us rather than like the little tiny step that you have to take that day and just keep taking the little steps. And then also I have a lot of patience because it's going to take a while. Um, you're not going to make any money <laughs> at the beginning. Like, and that's okay. And just know that like almost nobody makes any money at the beginning. And so if you like take that off of your shoulders and just have the face like what I always have to do is like look at the companies that are the companies that I aspire to be and then look at how long they've been in business mm, yes. <laughs> and then realize that it took them like they've been in business that long a because they were doing something that they love and so they like weren't willing to give up and then b because they just kept taking little steps and it took them that long to do it and that's especially true of agriculture adventure ventures like I said because it takes so much work I also I think the biggest thing that Belinda and I are good at is knowing our weaknesses and so recognize your weaknesses and then try to find people who fill those so my sister and I are very alike in so many ways but we are very different in a lot of ways and then it's that like recognizing your differences and this is like going to like the family business part of like but then also appreciating your differences, which can be really challenging because a lot of times it's your differences that also cause you to fight. (laughs) So, but you you can tell that this is something that you really love. And and so, so what is it about this work? What is it about Simple Goodness Sisters that you find so fulfilling? What is it that you find so life-giving? For me, it is that I can be as creative as I want to be. And that I, I think this is why a lot of farmers go into the work that they do, but like, it's the lifestyle more than anything else. I definitely work harder now than I did before. Um, but it's on my terms and I tend to have that like entrepreneurial personality where that's what drives me to keep going is that ultimately our role as moms has been 
a big um, motivating factor. And when we think about like the alternative, it's just not something that we want to do. Um, and so we just like keep pushing because this gives us the life that we enjoy. Yeah. Yeah. Well, as we kind of maybe wrap this up a little bit, what's next for Simple Goodness Sisters? Is there anything that you could tell us, hey, we're working on or maybe be looking forward to in the next uh, little bit? That's a great question and something that we are like thinking about right now. Like I said, we just opened the photo shop. So that is where all of our focus is and getting through the summer. Um, Cocktail Farm Club is probably our big- biggest what's next um, just because that we've only shipped two flavors. So we ship lime basil in our March box and then we ship huckleberry spruce tip, which was is one of our like absolute fan favorite flavors. Um, and then we are shipping a cucumber jalapeno in July. And so we're still like building out those flavors and then bottling them. Um, we are also in peak production right now. So we are producing, we produce all summer um, for the next 12 months. And so that's what we're working on right now. And then in terms of what's next, our startups are very, very giftable. People love buying them for friends and family. We ship all over the nation. And so holiday season is extremely busy for us. So we're thinking about, you know, what kind of packages we're going to put together. And then in terms of long term, um, I'm not 100% sure yet that we are like at that kind of cusp of our business of like, we're growing. And so we're trying to figure out what that next move is. And the cool thing is that there's a bunch of different directions that we can go. Um, and so we haven't landed on anything solid yet, because honestly, we are just working on keeping up with demand right now. <laughs> well, this is a very exciting time, though. And uh, I'm really excited to see what happens next. You are really putting a name name to Wilkeson. I'm, I, it makes me want to visit. And I know it's a small little town, but Maybe it's the next destination stop in Washington. Yeah. I mean, I definitely think, you know, it's one of the smallest. We don't have a lodge at our entrance, so it's not as visited as the rest. But our attractions that are within driving distance are actually the coolest. So we have um, Mowich Lake, which is one of the only lakes that you can um, get to without having to hike. So it's like you park and then you get to go to the lake. We love August is the best time to go to that lake because it's like beautiful and the kids can swim in it. Um, and then we have the carbon river, which is one of the only places that you can bike in the park. So that's pretty cool. Um, and then Wilkinson is just incredibly historic. You know, you look at towns, our sister town is Roslyn. And so you look at Roslyn and how much that has grown. Um, we would love to keep, I think everyone would love to keep Wilkinson really small and authentic. And so I think that's like, what is on top of mind for town right now. And, you know, I know there's a lot of rural communities who are going through this right now too. So, you know, it'll be interesting to see how um, the town changes, but hopefully we can keep its small town charm. But it sounds you're you're making it happen and it's definitely worth it. Thank you. It's definitely inspiring to hear what you guys have been doing. I mean, you jumped in in the probably the craziest year that anyone could join um, a business venture. And so it's inspiring to hear just your guys' positive outlook you have. Um, and I know that we're excited at Farm Bureau to see, see where, what happens next for you all. If you want more information about Simple Goodness Sisters and the work and products that they offer, you can visit their website at www.simplegoodnesssisters.com or visit their soda shop in Wilkeson. It's good stuff. The WFB Update is a production of the Washington Farm Bureau, the voice of agriculture in Washington State, ensuring our family farms continue to feed the world. To learn more, visit our website at www.wsfb.com.